good evening doctors uh, i am uh, samrat loth uh, gm marketing of gopi kriti care and uh, i will be the coordinator for this uh, webinar and with this uh, i will be handing over the session to our president dr uh, devesh das uh, over to you sir thank you samrat uh, good evening doctors uh, let me first uh, welcome all our delegates today from all over the country and nepal i welcome all our respected speakers also myself dr devesh das president domestic formulation india and nepal do appreciate uh, your attendance for this webinar which is uh, actually it is the fourth webinar of us in a row those who are attending uh, our webinar uh, uh, from the preceding months and uh, last few months uh, for them it is a repetition uh, of my uh, talk but uh, for the newcomers and for all new peoples um uh, i just wanted to uh, announce a small uh, success uh, which has happened just recently uh, american society of tropical medicine and hygiene uh, which is a very prestigious uh, world uh, body uh, they have their uh, annual meeting uh, from november 15th to 19th this year and uh, the poster late baker e poster on thymosin alpha 1 induced improved outcome in covid 19 attributed to the restoration of lymphocytopenia a case study which has been done by dr omkar gupta and dr vivek joshi from indore in coordination with dr navneet has been accepted and it is a first uh, uh, international publication uh, in the form of e poster uh, on thymosin alpha Uh, in covid patients uh, so it is a big big uh, 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 big step from us uh, from the academic point of view uh, i just wanted to share with my audience and everybody uh, so congratulation uh, to dr ankur uh, who was uh, our first case study presenter in our first webinar if i remember when uh, dr om shivastav has taken you through thymosin alpha a paradigm shift for uh, management of covid so that was our first topic uh, later on uh, when our second webinar was there uh, we were talking on t cells uh, so the t cell the unsung warrior the effect of thymosin alpha uh, on t cell and that is been taken by uh, dr om uh, himself our third webinar uh, was uh, a little bit different on uh, on the main topic on thymosin alpha and also we have uh, we have uh, told the first ctri investigation related uh, initiated trial which was been conducted by dr rahul pandit of fortis mulund uh, mumbai uh, he has unveiled that and the entire trial is over and will be very shortly coming to you with the trial reports simultaneously in uh, kasturba hospital mumbai the trial is going on uh, that is investigator initiated trial where dr om sivastav is one of um, uh, he is the chief um, uh, investigator and in nanavati hospital mumbai uh, the trial is also going on in our earlier uh, webinar we have got uh, the case studies from dr vimal nanka as i have told you dr ankur gupta and dr chinmay gorbole and today i am very happy to uh, inform you that uh today our webinar uh, which is the fourth webinar in a row uh, uh our speaker is dr om shivasta uh, everybody of you know by this time dr om is the consultant infectious disease and hiv medicines jaslok hospital mumbai sir hn reliance hospital mumbai kasturba hospital mumbai and many other hospitals he will be taking you uh, through uh, the topic thymosin alpha 1 insights to manage inflammation to infection and infection in covid 19 patients so this will be the topic which will be taken by om sir 
And today we have a case presentation from two eminent speakers, Dr. Pankaj uh, Kumar Omar, uh, who is the director of critical care, Sri Narayan Hospital, Raipur, and Dr. Vilas Tambe, who is the director of Tambe Critical uh, Hospital, Critical Care Hospital, Nagpur, and uh, the father figure, I can say, in critical care um, management in the entire country. So um, uh, this program will be followed by panel discussion where all our speakers will be uh, our panelists, along with Dr. Navneet Wadwa, uh, who is always our coordinator and uh, he is uh, very close to us. And uh, last three uh, webinars, he has also been uh, very kind enough to be coordinator with us. And Dr. Adar Sethi, who is our medical advisor, uh, he will be also one of the panelists. Uh, so uh, without any uh, wasting any further time, uh, I would like to just give a brief regarding Thymosin Alpha. Uh, Gufik uh, is the first company um, in the country who has introduced Thymosin Alpha in the name of Immunosin Alpha a uh, few months back. And uh, with your blessing and support, um, there are six centers where DCGI um, uh, trial is going on, that is phase three trial is going on, and the trial report is expected within a few months. And uh, so far we have uh, around 2000 patients uh, who had been tried uh, with uh, Immunocin Alpha uh, with the 600 physicians uh, and uh, chest physicians and intensivists they have used. And uh, we have got a very, very, very successful uh, result uh, with immunosin alpha. Uh, though the cases are increasing across the world, I was taking the number, it was around 4.53 crore populations in the world have been affected by COVID-19 and uh, 12 lakh is the death. In India, um, our death is um, approximately 1.21 lakh and with 80 lakh cases and every day we are adding around 50,000 patients. With this, we have uh, very less options to tackle this disease. And I feel um, uh, with remdesivir, with uh, LMWH, with uh, ilunostatin, uh, with um, doxycycline, uh, all these things, uh, uh, there is a paradigm shift in the management of COVID-19 patient with immunological uh, angle. And their thymosin alpha gives uh, the cutting edge. Uh, with this, I, uh, I, I hand over the session uh, to again Samrat. Samrat will uh, take you through the proceeding. Thank you very much once again and uh, over to Samrat. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> with this, uh, I will be inviting our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Om Srivastap, uh, to uh, present his topic. Uh, over to Dr. Om Srivastap. Uh, uh, sir, your mic is uh, in mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, sir, it's audible. All right. So, uh, once again, uh, RTS, congratulations to uh, Dr. Debesh Das and Alkem. Uh, Gufik, I'm sorry, that's that's an error on my part. Hearties, congratulations to, to Gufik and Dr. Debesh Das uh, uh, for the paper being accepted. That's 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 a good achievement. I think it's going to go a long way in uh, establishing the importance of such publications, especially since it is, uh, you know, it is it is uh, scientifically proven. So it's a first step in, in 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 several several things that are going to be that are going to be following. Uh, congratulations to both your authors. As Dr. Debesh Das has already spoken about, uh, uh, the the uh, experiences of people who are using uh, who are using uh, Times in Alpha. Uh, I am going to be sharing some part of my my experiences as well, but I will do that after we finish with the with the slides. Uh, the slides are actually some part of the slides while you might find they're a little bit theoretical i want to talk about my own points of view and my own experiences with most of these slides so can we get started please can we load the first slide uh, 
Okay, so infection or inflammation, which is the one aspect that needs to be handled more carefully? Next slide, please. All right, so look, uh, this is, I don't think this is necessary, but we'll just run through these. These are some of the things that have been associated with me. Uh, I, I have to say that, you know, if a speaker takes any more than one breath to introduce himself, the rest of what he says is more about his ego than anything else. So my name is Om Srivastava. I practice infectious diseases in Mumbai and that should suffice. Thank you. All right. Some, some of the publications that I have, I've had, uh, I've had fun printing up all of these things, but I think that we will simply put this on one slide and keep going. Thank you, Devesh, for, uh, for making the slide. It's, uh, it's very flattering, but thank you. We'll keep going. Okay, in terms of the overview, now this is uh, this is uh, this is various phases of COVID that we are mostly familiar with. You know those viral dynamics, which are uh, which are usually in the first part, uh, virus dynamics and immune phases, uh, both are actually responsible for determining the total amount of the severity of the virus, as I'm sure we are all familiar with. The big question is, the big question, the really big question is are we missing out the optimal time for the treatment window, right? Is the infection or the inflammation, which is more harmful to COVID-19. So this is, of course, this is part of the biggest, the big, big debate. And then if you look at, if you look at most of the trials, okay, the, the ACTT1, which is the, the, the adaptive trial or the recovery trial that has just concluded and come out with their, with their uh, findings or some of the other trials that is, looking at the, the ICMR regulations, which steroid is the better steroid? There is also the REACT uh, and the, uh, the COVACTOR trial uh, and the, and the uh, uh, MET-COVID trial also should not, we should not disregard that as well. And of course, the last point, which is a little bit of uh, going into those controversial areas, are bats going to be the big concern for COVID, whether it comes under control or not. Next slide, please. All right, so pretty clear about, uh, you know, the clinical clinical parts about the various various phases of COVID. There is that, that part where the virus is shed. And the shedding of the virus is, is something that we know that goes on for the first seven days for sure. It goes on for about seven to 10 days. We are reasonably sure. Beyond that, there is some amount of conjecture and speculation, whether it, it exists in the endotracheal tubes or on ventilators. So does it keep getting shed till about, till about the 10th, 12th day, maybe even the 13th, 14th day? The WHO consensus statement in the month of uh, July, August this year said that there is no evidence that the virus is shed beyond the 15th day, right? After that, it is only viral particles, which are dead particles and not the virus in itself. That may go on for several weeks and several months after the acute infection is over. So the second phase brings with itself its own problems. There are bigger problems that come with the second phase. To my mind, the burden of COVID is, is actually very manageable in the first about seven to 10 days time. And in the second phase, which may last for several weeks, several months in, in some instances, that is the one part which is going to be already trickier and to my mind this is my own personal opinion it's actually going to be trickier still as we go along how long will the effects of virus uh, of thymus of uh, the, the 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 inflammatory state of covid last i don't know if anybody knows but i have a feeling and i hope i'm wrong it's going to be lasting for several months maybe even a few years after covid is you know no longer as urgent as it is right now next slide please okay so again you know some of the some of the publications that have looked at some very specific uh, specific features, uh, especially you know the viral dynamics and the immune correlation of coronavirus, which are uh, you know in terms of the the severity. Like I was saying just in the previous slide, what is it that is going to be determining how severe COVID is going to be in in each individual? Are there markers of those severity? Yes, I think that in my own practice practice, I tend to employ something which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an algorithm for high risk, 
uh, we are also Dr. Uh, Naveen Vadva, Ravneet Vadva, and myself. We are uh, looking at, 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 at writing up something that will look at some other aspects. I don't think it is fair to talk about that on this platform. But uh, uh, at a later date or at a different platform, I'll be happy to share that with Dr. Navneet as well. So severity, is there a way to look at it, define it, correlate it? Yes, there is. To my mind, there is. But we need to, we need to refine it before you can start talking about it and show the results that will stand scientific scrutiny. Next slide, please. Okay, viral load in upper respiratory sp uh, specimens of infected individuals. So a lot of debate whether, you know, whether in somebody who is not responding or is a slow responder or having more and more complications, whether you should put in a, you know, uh, a bronchoscope and find out the specimens from the lower respiratory tract, is that the richest source? Well, possibly is, but also you've got to look at getting it from the upper respiratory tract as well, because both these specimens have their own own you know value you can't disregard one as uh, in 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 favor of the other but has to be taken in perspective of what is the most important specimen at that time in your patient's recovery next slide please okay so the big question and i think that to my mind this is probably the most important slide in this talk are we missing the optimal treatment and why should i say that because we have been talking about uh, and this is something that both myself and a number of my colleagues, uh, we've been talking about this regularly at various platforms across the country, is the most important timing of any therapy being missed. Okay, so that means when we say let's treat patients who are moderate or severe, moderately severe or very severe, then let us start with, you know, whatever you want. Remdesivir, what is the point of remdesivir after the first seven days or eight days or 10 days? I can't see the point. So I don't start that in my practice. Whether there is a point of steroids, yes, of course there is. Whether there is a point of uh, uh, you know plasma or other therapies, the point is again, you know, to my mind, the point is that you've got to start the therapy before the cytokine mechanism kicks in in your patient's immunological response. And so, what is the most optimal point? Is it in the first 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours? Is it in the first three days time? Is it uh, you know later than that? What happens if your patient continues to deteriorate after the first 12 hours? Can you time it there? What happens when you continue thymosin alpha for seven days, eight days, 10 days? What happens there? What happens then? So look, these are questions. Right now, what we are answering these questions with is our own scientific experience. And it is to some part, and I don't mind saying it myself, but it's some part scientific conjecture. All of this is going to require solid, hard bound evidence that can be dealt with on a scientific platform and it will stand the scrutiny of people who will assess this evidence. So we are not yet there, but hopefully as we look at those patients who did well on a particular therapy, those patients who did badly on another therapy, why did they do badly? When you're timing the therapy, in an identical patient at the same time as you had timed it to another patient who did well, why is this patient doing badly? So these are questions that we need to understand. You know, again, when I, I, I have to say, I have a flaw in my, in, my, in my talks, and that is that everything that I talk about ultimately comes back to my own approach towards infections from the point of view of an immunologist. So it is never going to be the virus or the bacteria or the fungus that is going to kill your patient. It's actually going to be your patient's immune response that is going to decide how your patients are going to, you know, either survive or not survive, sadly, unfortunately. And that's the point. That's the point that I'm making. Timing of the therapy for optimal treatment must be such that before your patient's immune response starts, that is a time when you're going to be using the treatment that you want to use. And that is why Thymosin alpha is more an immunomodulator than anything else. All right, that is, the, that is the key of the molecule. It will work on modulating the immune response of your patient. And that is why it is going to be having more advantage than most of the agents we are talking about, except for the steroids that we know are definitely having a role in the immune suppression. And of course, maybe some of the molecules that I'm not going to speak here about. Thymosin alpha's biggest advantage is that it is an immunomodulator. Next slide, please. 
So, of course, this is a question that we ask ourselves all the time. Which one is worse, the infection or the inflammation? Next slide, please. Okay, some more perspectives. Okay, some more perspectives insofar as those medical, those uh, 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 agents that are repurposed. Okay, there is some survival advantage in the use of all of these agents. Okay, some of the some of the survival advantage and 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 lack of complications may be minuscule, but that again is as a matter of when it should be timed. So everybody will follow their own guidelines of when it should be timed their own hospital guidelines, the international guidelines, but ultimately do remember that these are guidelines and boundaries. They should not be stopping you from taking the decision yourself because as a clinician, we are guided by what is the biggest risk of the patient? What is the biggest risk? And if you think that you've met a patient who's got high risk uh, for complications or that there are those parameters that indicate that these, these patients are going to do badly, then should you be timing a particular therapy, and I'm here I'm going to be talking only about thymosin alpha. Should you be timing it at an earlier stage? And what is the advantage of that earlier stage time? So that we can look at not just so in the trial that, that we are doing at Kasturbo Hospital, where I am the PI. Unfortunately, I can't discuss that in great details, but we are having some very good responses because we have timed it correctly. We have timed it in a stage, and that is the one one you know big issue that I discussed with Dr. Devesh Das that when we are setting out the protocol, I would like it to be set in such a way that we need to offer a certain advantage to the patient who is unwell and not wait for it for him to become critically ill before we offer this molecule. So I think that it works. Uh, of course, definitely, I start think I'm quite sure the thymosin alpha works. I'm also certain that we time it correctly in the early part of the disease and it works far better. Next slide, please. Okay, some, some further... Uh, uh, reports of uh, you know some agents like remdesivir in the treatment you can see it's fairly fairly busy slides this is of course the the uh, the final results of the act trial and that you will see that remdesivir irrespective of what uh, any of the regulatory bodies in the world will have to say all of us will agree that remdesivir works okay and if you say that remdesivir does not work then please somebody tell me uh, why is it that a disease that has got this much of Mortality the world over has mortality in single digits in a country like ours in India. Is it only good intensive care? Does that mean that intensive care all over the country is 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 identical? Is that the same? Well, I don't think so. We are looking at some of the some of the death audits of Maharashtra alone. In Maharashtra alone, some of the death audits have have different side scenarios to, to to share with us, and that I can tell you right now without casting any aspersions on anybody, intensive care at different levels, whether just outside Mumbai or in the interiors of Maharashtra, have different levels. So I would have to say that all the trials and all the information that we're talking about is very wonderful and very welcome, but it does not give us the entire picture of what we want. So let's, let's look at these trials and their outcomes, but let us structure those studies in our own intensive care units or our own hospitals, which will tell us the information that we are seeking that has not come through, through through these trials. Next slide, please. Okay, the recovery trials, I'm sure all of you are familiar. 11 and a half thousand people who were participant of the trial, not a small number, very well structured, very well randomized, but their conclusions again, you know, some of the things that they have concluded with, I speak to a lot of people who are authorities in India on, on, on COVID. And there is a, a degree of disagreement in most of these people. So again, I come back to the point that we are making. Even though recovery is a very good trial, I still think that it can be the, the sub-analysis, the data of, of the data that came out of recovery can be looked at very differently, very carefully. And probably the interpretation is going to be different to, 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 to that as well. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, something that we have we have looked at and debated. I spoke to Dr. Adarsh uh, about this when, when this slide was being made. Hydroxychloroquine has a role. As far as I am concerned, hydroxychloroquine has a role in prophylaxis. It is a very good immunomodulator, and that's the reason why there is a role for hydroxychloroquine. All right, it can be used, I don't know, in treatment, but the, the dose that we use for hydroxychloroquine is something which is 
uh, as an as an immunomodulator and and in a prophylactic situation it works very well however if you look at the most current data from trials alone it appears to be having a little less uh, you know clear indication in these situations so again i don't think we've heard the last of hydroxychloroquine we'll probably hear hear a great deal as time goes on but that is going to go on for several months maybe a couple of years so as as the as the americans say watch this space okay next slide please placid look i what what can i say uh, i was a part of placid the icmr trial uh, the arm that was at at kasturba hospital where we looked at plasma and uh, and what can come out of plasma i personally have used plasma in over 70 patients in over 70 patients and i have to tell you except for three where i timed it badly because of various reasons everybody else survived and did well all right so i am a little reluctant to accept the conclusion of the placid trial that it does not work plasma to my mind works very well in reasons that we still don't know everything about so i am a little reluctant to accept this this response but what i would like is to have a more more organized trial from my point of view in 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 the kind of results that i want to see about plasma so i i again this slide is only for one reason i don't think that people within the scientific community are all going to be having the same opinion of everybody else especially you know the, the people who have done the bigger trials everywhere else in the world that is definitely it's a point of view that should be respected and taken but it does not mean that you have to agree with it all the time next slide please okay so uh, you know these are some of the some of the releases that have come out as to as to you know the the uh, in council of medical research what are their, their their points of view like i was saying a little bit earlier and the, like i said these are evidences at this point in time it does not mean that this is something that is set in stone or it is not going to change if we look at it carefully in the set of patients that we are seeking a different confirmation i am sure we will come up with our own conclusions next slide please yeah okay so uh, jama articles yes again in so in so far as uh, in so far as convalescent plasma is concerned what are the outcomes what are the results i would have to say that yes again it's a repetition of what i have been saying while it is true that the placid trial and the platina the platina is an ongoing trial while it is true that some of these trials may have had a different conclusion it does not mean if you simply look at if you simply look at five people in bombay alone mumbai alone who have used plasma in more than 50 patients i think you will find that their conclusions of plasma in the sickest and the not so sick patients are uh, are very different to all these trials and this includes me as well and so i they, you know this is a discussion that me and dr navneet have been having quite regularly this kind of conclusion may be biased and that it does not mean that they have looked at all the aspects that we want to and that only means that we should look at what can be done as an investigator initiated trial i think that we we can very 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 easily translate the investigator initiated trials into our practice in our hospitals but it 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 requires that people look at this so all of these slides that we have just gone through are more a matter of trying to look at a molecule you know i i i was not uh, going to speak about plasma as much but a molecule like thymosin alpha the the kind of benefits it gives it is very much like a monoclonal antibody right it is very much like a monoclonal antibody and that is why there is a role for positioning something like thymosin alpha but like any other molecule if you don't position it correctly it's not going to give you any benefit at all so that's the point next slide please right which steroid is better again that's that's a lot of debate i think the biggest uh, data that came of the out of the oxford trials spoke about dexamethasone if your patient is hospitalized in icu then it's either 4 mg or 6 mg if your patient is in the community looking after himself or herself at home then it is 0.5 mg is that once a day or twice a day and for how long well the how long part there are those people who are going to be at risk for complications for several weeks after the acute infection is over a number of parameters that can be done and looked at are being looked at some of them are being overly used all right i don't know how many of of us here are doing the homocysteine levels 
I'm doing that. I've got, I've got out of 300 patients, I've got about, I've got a, 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 a series of about 230, 240 patients with abnormal homocysteine with normal B12 levels. I'm sure those of us who are general physicians in this talk will agree that you can have a surreptitiously low or high homocysteine level, uh, uh, which is uh, misleading because your patient's B12 levels are low. But if your patient has normal B12 levels, then homocysteine is homocysteine an independent marker of vascular events, a thrombotic event. I'm still looking at the data. At some stage, when it is ready, it is ready to be ratified and I publish it, I'll be happy to share it on, you know, if Dr. Devesh Das agrees, I'll be happy to share it on this platform alone. But the point is, again, there is so much about the information that we are seeking or we are employing in our practice that is changing on such a regular fashion, in, on a regular basis, that the only thing that any one clinician can do is to keep their eyes and ears wide open and be able to adapt to the change that is coming our way with COVID. Next slide, please. Okay, again, you know, dexamethasone, if you have a look at dexamethasone, you know, even though methylprednisolone has a big advantage, dexamethasone in smaller doses, 0.5 milligram once a day, as a prophylactic for vascular events is something that goes a long way if you do uh, simply an ultrasound that you can employ in a patient's ICU, where you would do the, the, the pulmonary ultrasounds, where the deep veins can be looked at, a lot of places where you can do simplistic tests. You don't have to be having a, a, a Tesla machine with a with a 64 cut in your hospital that will be that will be available to everybody. But you can do a number of other things, and dexamethasone definitely works. It's got a role in survival advantage and a, a big big advantage in preventing complications. Next slide, please. Okay, recovery trial. I've already I've already spoken about it briefly. Like I said, you know, 11,500 patients, not a small number. Uh, you know, the total number of people who were, who were looked at the trial, they came to the conclusion that there was no benefit amongst those patients who did not require any support. And so again, like I said, I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to be too, too affected by the outcomes of this trial. We probably need to structure a trial which are investigated, initiated in our own practice. Next slide, please. Okay, then some other, some more, some more publications. The association between the administration of uh, some agent systematically, corticosteroids particularly, and the mortality. Right, so it is clearly established. The advantage is clearly there. It has to be timed correctly, and the exit also has to be timed correctly. So you stop it prematurely, and your patients may not have the kind of benefit you are seeking. And so in some situations, you will need to continue the, the steroid in your patients at high risk for a little bit longer. Next slide, please. Okay, again, methylprednisolone as adjunct therapy. Does methylprednisolone help? Well, there's a, that's, that's something which is, which is still debatable. The debate really is that methylprednisolone, because it has got a mineral corticoid effect, it helps in patients' blood pressure supports, especially in ICU. Dexamethasone may not have that same advantage, but if you start early enough, your patient may not need to go to ICU in the first place. So a little bit debate, but that's the best part about COVID. I think that we will all agree that what, what we knew in the last week of March is different to what we know in the last week of October. And hopefully, you know, when we meet again, whenever, whenever that is, we will know a lot more in, you know, three months, four months, six months, and that we will have learned a great deal because of what we see in our own practice, in the in the publications that come our way, and that we will be probably discarding some of the things that we know, and accepting some of the things that we you know as as we go along. So steroids was not the mainstay of treatment in the month of April or May. It became mainstay in the month of July or August, I think somewhere there. But now it is it is a crucial part of our patients' treatment. Can't be discarded, and that is the point that I'm making. What we knew three months, six months, seven months ago is different to what we know now. Next slide, please. All right, tocilizumab, whether it, you, it, is, it is useful or not, there doesn't appear to be any survival benefit on the, the, the Covacta trial. Uh, you know, uh, tocilizumab was so popular just about a month ago that it was difficult. You know, people would call up and say, can you speak to the people who are making, manufacturing uh, this molecule? And can we have this at short notice? 
just about two weeks ago, I have people in hospitals calling me up to say, listen, we've got some spare supplies. Do you have any patient who needs this molecule? All right. So times change, evidence changes, and what was very popular and very required one month ago, six weeks ago, two months ago, is something that is now considered to be redundant, no longer useful in the, the, the treatment of, of COVID. So that is that that's again, and I'll just repeat the point that I'm making that there is so much of evidence coming our way that says definitively, clearly, one way or the other, about several ideas and concepts in the treatment of COVID. Next slide. Okay, key key covacta. I'm not going to go through 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 a lot of details here. There does there's a, appear to be time to hospital discharge shorter in patients treated with tocilizumab than in those patients with, with placebo. However, ventilator-free days was not in a situation of being statistically significant. At an average, patients still required about 22 days, three weeks, which is about the time that we we accept for somebody who comes into you know ICU. Families ask us that question. I'm sure they ask you as well. How much is the time that this patient is going to take? That's going to be about between two and three weeks time, not less than two. And if all is well, it should be three weeks or a little bit longer. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, some other molecules. IL-6 inhibitors like uh, cerulumab. What is the what is the role in uh, severely severely COVID ill patients? Uh, basically, the thing is the the last line. All right, the 28, 26 to 29 percent of patients who experience serious adverse effects. And that is where this molecule is going to be. Well, it will require to be undergoing a lot more scrutiny than what it has so far. It may still be good. It may still be good. I don't think we should disregard it, but it's it's not going to be good in the evidence that is available with us at this time. So again, again, I'm going to repeat what I said a little while ago, watch the space and let's have a look at what is the evidence coming our way in another month or two months time. Next slide. Okay, I think that this is a slide for discussions over cocktails and dinner, Dr. Devesh Das. Okay, I think that we should have a separate, separate meeting for this slide alone. Yes, I think everybody who's giving a feedback, please let us uh, let us encourage Gufik and Dr. Devesh Das that this must be settled differently. Okay, do. Do bats tolerate SARS COVID 2? Let me tell you the one, just the one fact. In the in the exotic meat markets from, from China, from where bats were supposed to have started this whole story, the first such market was 80 kilometers away from the first set of patients that got that got COVID-19. Okay. And that there were no bats between these two distances. So again, we are very ready to implicate some things that we think because we need to have the closure in our minds as to how did this start? It started like this. We are not comfortable in a situation where we don't know how it started or how it's going to finish. That is human nature. But I don't think that this part is, is conclusively proven, although I have to say, I have seen a very good documentary that's on YouTube. If you want, personally, please get in touch with me. I will share it with you. It's a long documentary, but it's a very good study on how the virus, how the epidemic, pandemic would have started. But I don't think this is the right platform to discuss this. Next slide, please. Okay, like I was saying earlier, yes. thymus and alpha is something which is multifaceted. It works at several levels. It is not just one part of the patient's immune system. It is multifaceted, all right? We probably don't know enough about thymus and alpha. We, because I'll, again, thymus and alpha in COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 is something that we are still just beginning to understand and study. As time goes on, and you know, we probably will be doing more refined endpoints of, the, of several more trials from, from here for thymus and alpha and the immune endpoints. And that is when we will know more, more acutely as to how Thomas and Alpha affects the patient and how does it work. For sure it works, like I said, if you position it correctly, you time it correctly, for sure it works. And like everything else in the treatment of COVID, if you don't time it correctly, it's not going to work. But if you do that, I think that the benefits of Thomas and Alpha are multiple. And some of them we are ourselves not aware about right now. 
but we will probably need to work that towards the immune status of patients and that is where we'll probably get all the information that is going to be a wealth of information and that is what we are seeking next slide please okay some more some more literature from the clinical infectious diseases we've we've looked at there is a lot of literature that's available uh, i'm i'm just going to go through uh, some parts of this as of as of this this talk here today the importance of looking at the immune parts especially the t cell function look to my mind to my mind that is the key the key to all such all such recoveries is about the t cell but remember also i'm sure those of you who are practicing immunologists the t cell in itself is is useless you know it is it is what is called in uh, in uh, in hindi it is what is called the raj yog all right in itself it is not going to do anything until it gets the b cell which is the antigen presenting cell the apc until the b cell and the apc are given to it it is only going to be just sitting down and watching all the drama of an infection as soon as it gets the antigen presenting cell the t cell becomes active after that it is the showman of all infections and all immunological disorders so this again is a is a is a talk of a whole day debate and i'm quite happy to talk for several hours on this aspect but for the time being let me just say that the t cell responses in your patient are what is going to determine how your patient is going to be behaving and that there is a lot of interest in thymus and alpha and t cell responses thymus and alpha probably has the ability to persuade a t cell and a b cell to be more proactive in overcoming a difficult infection in your patient than we know but we probably need like i've been saying all along we need to have scientific evidence that will stand scientific scrutiny okay next slide please why children are less affected i'm not a pediatrician i think those of us who are pediatrician uh, will agree that the thymus gland may have a very important role thymus glands usually you know they start getting active by the time a child go you know is 12 to 13 13 14 years old and it remains active till the time you're about 60 65 it starts to slow after that but the t cell lymphocyte that starts from there can be active with a memory for several years after the thymus in itself has become slow so children and thymus is again you know it's a it's a very important aspect but i don't think we are going to be discussing that children for a very complex set of reasons do not get affected with the severity of covid that adults do and a lot lot of it has to do with the thymus gland and the t cells there next slide please okay molecular mechanisms of sex bias all right this is the other thing i'm sure those of you who are who are endocrinologists will will also uh, uh, recollect a lot of lot of data that came out of april may where uh, covid is meant to be living in the gonads of males and that advantage it does not have in females naturally because of the way males are structured and that some of the mechanisms that come out of there the, the this bias of why men are meant to be you know a little more at risk than females for complications and mortality comes out of that part but again that is that is scratching the surface you know we know may, maybe about 100000th 1 millionth of the inf information that is meant to come our way but suffice it to say there is a sex bias and there is a molecular mechanism and again that will come back to the t cell that will de decide the mortality index of your patient next slide please okay i'm going i'm going to skip skip this slide we've we've gone this we've gone through this uh, uh, in the past so yeah let's skip it right some of the other publications the immune modulation of thymus and alpha i cannot emphasize that you know enough the modulation of the immune system is so important and that it is something that we understand so little of that you know i would urge of devesh das and gufik to please uh, please consider lots more studies besides what we have done to understand the the mechanism the impact of the immune system in this in this kind of situation next slide please okay so uh, a lot of drugs and trials for covid we can definitely say which drug is going to be effective at what level is something that we still don't know this is where immunomodulation and modulating of the immune system plays such an important role 
Thymosin alpha is a safe immunomodulator, definitely for COVID-19. I can say that with my own experience of thymosin alpha in my own patients, one is the trial, the other is where I'm using it. And I can say that with the experience that I have shared uh, with others as well. I think Dr. Devesh Das will agree. I can share the experience of one patient that I was involved in a remote uh, situation. The patient is the sister of a cardiothoracic surgeon in Mumbai. And she was, uh, she was based out of Jaipur. And nothing was working. Naturally, we, we were, the, the cardiothoracic surgeon was, was very anxious to see if something could be done. I spoke to the family. I told them that, look, this is, uh, this is a molecule that we should try. And they have sent me images. Uh, I can't share that here on this platform. But they have sent me images of this lady who, after her tracheostomy, is now walking, mobilizing. She's gone home. So it's a good story. And I think that a lot of the situations, her, her baseline, her borderline structures, she was also a patient of multiple sclerosis. And her immune parameters were something that were totally off the radar. And that's where, again, I thought that thymosin alpha would be a good choice. We used it. We used it for a little longer, about 10 days' time. But it came up with, with a lot of results that were very good. So again, immunomodulation is, is by far the, the game changer in patients who've got COVID-19. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is, this is, the, this is the most important part. You know, something that is, uh, that, is, that is going to be the key, the cornerstone, the, the backbone, the spine of therapy that will look at recovery of patients who are mildly sick or very sick or at their deathbed, and that it's not simply going to be an antiviral agent and not simply going to be something which is, which is like an interleukin-6 inhibitor. It will have to be something that works at multiple levels, and it will have to be at a time that your patient's cytokine storm has not yet started, so that your patient's immune system is able to dictate that this is the direction that it has to go through and not the direction that would have happened if indeed your patient's cytokines were, you know, a thousand times above their baseline. So I'm going to stop here. I want to thank uh, Dr. Devesh Das and Gufik for give, giving me this opportunity. I want to thank all of you for a very patient hearing. And if you have a question, I will try and do my best to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, uh, for this uh, interesting uh, presentation you have given. And uh, without further wasting any time, I will be requesting Dr. Uh, Pankaj Omar uh, to uh, please share his uh, case study over here. Over to Dr. Pankaj Omar. Good evening, everyone. So today I'll be uh, presenting two cases. Uh, Please. So one of the case uh, which I the which is the first which one is the first case uh, where we had a patient next slide please. This patient was a, a gentleman of uh, fifty one years, and uh, he was running fever, high grade fever for last three days. Next slide please. So he was getting high grade fever for the last few days and he presented to us with this saturation. His uh, saturation on room air was 92 at the time. And patient was uh, stating that he is ill for the last four or five days. Patient was diabetic and on presentation his blood sugar was 450 plus. So that time we thought that we should have something which uh, uh, where we can uh, just uh, have an expectant watch and avoid uh, steroid at that time. So his CD score was 19. Patient was admitted in ICU with support of oxygen. So there he can achieve uh, a CO2 of more than 96. So the next slide, please. This was his CT scan presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Treatment, uh, we started him on Ramdesivir, 200 loading and then 100 mgvd. Uh, previous one, please. On LMWH, 0.4 
MLST VD, and we started thymosin alpha in the dose of 3.2 ml ST TDS. And then there were other supportive treatment, the form vitamin C and all that. So next, this one. So at presentation, uh, this patient has a uh, TLC of 9,500 and uh, TRP was 63. His uh, parietine level was 120 and he was started on oxygen. So on day two, his IL-6 was uh, 44 which on day second slightly raised to 59, but the patient was more or less stable. His uh, oxygen saturation slightly reduced. It came to 88 on room air, and we were achieving a fairly good, good level on six liter of oxygen at 99%. So we kept on him on uh, thymosin alpha without giving a steroid. On day four onwards, patient started uh, showing some improvement and gradually his TLC levels, CRP levels, all started falling down. So we were lucky enough and we could avoid uh, methylprednisone and dexamethasone in this patient. And then gradually his uh, WBC count also started raising. So uh, he came out of uh, his lymphopenia as well. On day 10, patient became, uh, was perfectly all right and well. His saturation was 98% on room air. He recovered out of his uh, very bad CT and uh, we could discharge him he came to follow up after 15 days. He was perfectly all right. We repeated his CRP level. This was again at baseline. So this patient was one of the example where we avoided uh, steroid and in spite of that, thymosin alpha was used because uh, in literature and uh, looking at uh, its uh, property, we know that it acts as an anti-C3A also. So thereby uh, it acts in the early stages of uh, cytokine storm where it uh, leads to reduction or uh, reduce propensity of a person to landing up in cytokine storm. Moreover, uh, it increases IL-10 levels as well as it also has property to increase uh, T8 and T4 cells. So this was one example, very good example. And uh, I'll be presenting another case. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, uh, bar diagrams where you can see a gradual reduction in uh, various uh, inflammatory markers. Next slide, please. This is another case. This is a very interesting case. This was a 53-year-old female patient weighing 105 kg. She was diabetic and presented with desaturation, high-grade fever. Uh, she tested positive for COVID test. Her CT score was 22 out of 25. Patient was uh, quite tachypneic and she was desaturating, not maintaining oxygen saturation. So she was kept on NIV support. Uh, we had uh, started toclizumab on day two. We had to give toclizumab on day two, uh, but she did not show any sign of improvement. Methylprednisone was going at the rate of 80 mg TDS. Then on day three, we uh, it is in, during that stage when uh, we were not uh, getting thymosin very I mean, easily. Uh, I think it, it was in uh, beginning of August. Uh, so on day three, we started uh, thymosin at a dose of because her weight was quite high. So we uh, we started at a dose of uh, three by CDS. Then uh, next slide, please. This was her CT scan. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So these were her markers. Like his, her ILC was 164 at presentation and CRP was uh, 252. So after giving toclizumab, we did not find that uh, uh, her uh, IL-6 has fallen down much. Uh, it became, it came to 123, but clinically patient was not good. So she was uh, barely maintaining 93% of oxygen saturation and on room air, it was falling down to 84 or below that. When we started uh, thymosin, she was on HFNO. So patient was, again, even at that time, she was uh, attack happening. But gradually, within the next 48 hours, we saw some sign of improvement in that patient. Uh, and then we repeated the markers. Markers also started falling down. Gradually, this patient recovered. And on uh, day 10, she was out of ICU on the minimal oxygen support level. Next slide, please. 
this is the bar diagram where we we can see various level of CRP and IL six, uh, which gradually started falling down. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this was her SPO two level that uh, this gradually kept on rising. So overall, uh, uh, I used uh, thymosin alpha in around around fifty patients uh, during these last two and a half months. Uh, overall, if I say that uh, the experience is good and I do not, I, I'm not getting any side effect of it. If if I say isolatedly for uh, thymosin alpha, otherwise overall experience is good and uh, patient do show some kind of improvement. Uh, moreover, we are analyzing the data and probably within, uh, by uh, this the uh, mid of uh, next month, uh, we would be getting uh, more uh, insight into the use of thymus in our, uh, in our patients uh, out of uh, this series of 50 patients. Uh, thank you. This this was my case presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Umar for the case presentation. Thank you. Attendees over here, if you have got any questions, uh, please do share the questions in the chat box. Uh, we will be taking up your questions during the panel discussion after Dr. Bilas Tambe's presentation. Over to Dr. Bilas Tambe. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, I'm audible. That's what. Um, uh, 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 it was a very excellent presentation by Om Shivastava and I strongly believe that when viremia is not there, are there the indicators when we can really have the, uh, the levels of immunological levels up to satisfy it, it? Just not the viral load, which is not possible. Uh, apart from lymphocytic counts, apart from CD4 counts up or things up. And I think immunology plays a very big role in all these viral infections, whether it is uh, um, COVID or before COVID up, if you consider. Uh, I have a very big question, which uh, I think uh, he can able to answer, and that is on why uh, the, the cytokine storm comes and why uh, the, uh, mm, uh, the most advocated drug who started the, the therapy to reduce this cytokine storm at, to start early, Zygris has not come in the, in the way early by most of the physicians who believe that uh, uh, the cytokine storm comes up with the, with the uh, not the viremia load. Anyway, uh, this case which I got was a very unfortunate case because, uh, can I have the first slide? Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very unfortunate that his wife, the other half, uh, came on 26th of uh, uh, um, September and, and uh, uh, she was so bad and she has not received any drug up while uh, this male, her husband, received everything what the best up uh, she can get. And uh, we lost the case on 28th and the husband got admitted and then I came to know that what he is having. Uh, his uh, uh, CRP was not uh, raised up. His D-dimer was within normal limits of ferritin, uh, procalcitonin, IL-6 were normal, but he had a persistent fever. And uh, uh, he was admitted because um, he was not, uh, the, the three members of the same family got admitted. He himself, his son and daughter-in-law, all three were admitted and all got cured. Can I have the next slide? And no, uh, his repeated CTs was done. The patient belongs to about 140 kilometers from Nagpur in an in a area where it was difficult to get a CT, but they used to come for CT. And you can see that at the beginning, how the progress of the disease comes up. The CORAT score was six and five, but the CT severity index was so low and suddenly it surged up on 24th. And that is the time when all the members in the family got it. The, the female did not take any treatment, but this person continued to have a treatment on 24th. The first remdesivir dose was given. 
so he was admitted with me on 28th of night and i think i uh, with that idea in the mind because il6 you get almost 2 to 3 days to get that report and we 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 uh, we only gave remdesivir the double drug and favipiravir of course the combination oral we gave steroids up, of course in a proper doses and uh, thymosin alpha and i strongly believe that immunology plays a very big role including the personal level when you are fit i think daily exercises the good immune nutrition plays a very big role in the survival and in the in the long term management of these patients up. and this patient was really lucky that uh, i could able to discharge him he received three doses of uh, uh, thymosin alpha he received no, next yeah and the severity index was uh, gone up to 8 but then uh, he was very well managed up with just binasal oxygen and uh, and that's the case which i want to share unfortunately in the case of wife i couldn't do the uh, um, her levels of what was the deficiency she was a case of a burn uh, treated by me about 80% burn treated by me 10 years back and now she came uh, she was diabetic but really we 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 lost the case and then the husband came and he he survived though the severity index was the ct severity index was low clinically he was needing a uh, very high flow oxygen to maintain his uh, uh, parameters but he was lucky and i think thymosin has really played a, a wonder in this case and i strongly believe that uh, those cases in which you are finding that the patient are needing uh, persistently the temperature is there and needing high doses of oxygen i think in those cases i think you should uh, um, make it a point to give apart from steroids uh, thymosin alpha right. yeah this was the the, the medicines given up, uh, to him and apart from that yeah uh, both oral and uh, remdesivir for total 10 doses uh, the uh, the other two were treated his son and daughter in law were treated on opd basis with remdesivir iv and, and they they their oxygen requirement was not there but uh, reducing just viral load is not the answer because after 7 days as rightly said uh, even though there is no viremia the the type of uh, um uh, cytokine crisis is so severe that it's very difficult to manage and then on ventilators uh, the adequate staff um, tracheostomy is subjecting yourself for uh, the thing all is a mental trauma and i think uh, uh, but it has taught us so many things of that uh, how timely the medicines can act uh, and it's good that uh, medicines are available nowadays you can have you know like uh, i always wonder the the lily has given uh, the trump uh, the new cocktail of uh, 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 <clears throat> monoclonal antibody and i think it is likely to come and i think it another six months we will start getting it up but the viral uh, viremia and the viral load should be one thing which i think uh, need to be done and need to be promoted in these cases and uh, as early as we get the cd4 count uh, and uh, the viremia load i think we can able to take these uh, uh, more clearly in our thought process which drug to be used up and what time i i i think uh, what uh, om shivastava has said is right that uh, it, it it is the timing on which uh, and this timing depends upon how clinical the patient respond it is not just keep on doing cts keep on making yeah but at the present state i personally feel that it is only the ct score severity index which tells us how bad is the lungs and the lungs are the main things affected in these cases and if they come out of the lungs i think they come out of the uh, thank you uh, for your uh, patience here Yeah, uh, doctor. Uh, uh, thank you, doctor uh, Thambe, uh, for the uh, presentation of the case study. And uh, with this, uh, I will be handing over the session now to doctor Narbhid Vadba to take us forward with the panel discussions. Thank you, Samrat. The questions has been forwarded to the panelists for my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Samrat. Uh, 
thank you dr om shrivatsav thank you dr pankaj and talk, thank you dr vilas sambe for a very humble presentation i would say in fact uh, i would like to share you know uh, this is one of the case dr what dr vilas sambe has shared but you know we have been discussing that how consistently he has in fact incorporated this uh, thymosin alpha in his institutional protocol and not just one case you know the variety of cases which has been he has managed you know the diversity and the spectrum and is as the as 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 a as a speakers uh, eloquently focused on the timing i think this is a learning in last 3 to 4 months that how timing would have own own implication i would not be you know wrong to put that in fact uh, to that extent the consistency of the response what dr vilas tambe has got it from his institution that was the encouragement to put this case forward it would not be wrong to call you know as a vilas tambe protocol or the vt protocol from his own institution you know uh, as as which has been consistently as a as a, you know uh, cocktail is a very uh, uh, lighter word to put it across but the permutation combinations whatever country has to offer you know the remdesivir the steroids the oxygen and coming in thymosin alpha uh, i would like to you know specially congratulate uh, dr vilas tambe that how he has utilize this as part of his consistently as part of his institutional protocol sir uh, we have couple of questions uh, all together uh, coming up a uh, 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 lot of them in fact uh, we have one question you know to begin with uh, from dr sudish sara that interleukin 6 how and if yes what is the current role and uh, is there any beneficial role i think dr om shrivastava can uh, take up that question because he has already worked a lot on this you know the 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 the, the controversial elements of uh, uh, tocilizumab how it started how where it is and you know the postulated benefits if any over to dr om shrivastava uh, uh, dr nadeep could you would you mind just repeating the question i didn't Sir, get the first yeah, yeah current status and benefits of interleukin 6 in the current uh, contemporary uh, evidence perspective sir Okay, so interleukin six. Look, it's probably one of the most uh, well described, but it is not the only cytokine. Interleukin six will start a number of mechanisms that are documented in the control or the overt expression of inflammation. But let me tell you that you know, even even pathways like the cyclooxygenase pathway or the lipooxygenase pathway or the arachidonic acid pathway, the leukotrienes four, LTD four. Leukotrienes one, two, and three. Leukotrienes four can be, you know, in vivo. Leukotriene four can be one thousand times as potent as, uh, you know, adrenaline. That's how potent it is. You know, so as a vasoconstrictor, leading to several events of occlusion. All right, leading to occlusion of the coronary arteries, the pulmonary arteries, the in the cerebral arteries. All of that is possible if this pathway, that is the leukotriene pathway. gets activate now from our own experience about these things the one thing that works best is aspirin because it is it is something that inhibits the cyclooxygenase pathway but that's not the only benefit so the point i am making is interleukin 6 is one and a very important you know cytokine but it's not the only one and that there are at least another 78 cytokines that have been described in the inflammatory response of number of viral infections not just covid number of viral infections and so how do you stop all of them you can't have one molecule that will stop all of them you are going to need something which is like a monoclonal antibody that will inhibit interleukin 1 interleukin 6 interleukin 17 tumor necrosis factor alpha and then look at the activation of something like cd6 all right all of these are important in starting a process that is protective of patients and all of them may be you know the trick there is that all of them may not be functional at the same time they'll get functional one after the other over a period of few hours sometimes over a period of few days sometimes they won't get functional at all so you cannot have a single molecule like tocilizumab that will inhibit interleukin 6 and hope that that is going to control the total cytokine storm that is going to happen in your patient cytokine storms as the name itself is is you know very evident storm will function at multiple levels at more than one level it will function at multiple levels so interleukin 6 inhibitors are not the only way that you are going to have to you know make a strategy for inhibition 
of cytokine, you know, the cascade, you will need a strategy that will have three or four or five molecules. And most times, as Dr. Navneet has rightly said, and Dr. Tambe also rightly said, we are going to be looking at some kind of a monoclonal antibody that will, you know, inhibit not one, not two, but maybe five or six such pathways and hope that that is all that is required. But right now, right now, Besides the tocilizumab, we've only got, you know, maybe a couple of molecules. There is a role for the antibodies that will come out of plasma. Yes, but we don't know enough about that. So all of these things need to be studied a little bit more. Very rightly said. I think, I think, I think in the era of, you know, when we say repurpose drug, you know, the, the first connotation which comes to our mind is the efficacy. But I think uh, the, 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 the side effect, what COVID has taught us, of the existing molecule, for example, you know, toxicism map. If we look back into the literature, uh, the side effect part, especially the GI perforations, the number of cases which have emerged, rheumatology never taught us that uh, perspective. You know, uh, the 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 repurpose, repurposing of the drugs also has taught out the, you know, the efficacy versus balancing out with the side effect, adverse effect profile. I think you know these are the new learnings in the COVID era that. Uh, the drugs which have been intend intended for the labeled indication perhaps has not taught us something which were undeciphered. New things are consistently emerging up uh, consistently. Uh, 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 in, in another interesting question is that, uh, you know, the biomarkers, biomarkers which has to be monitored when the patient uh, is undergoing treatment for COVID, especially with respect to thymus and alpha, uh, maybe the CD4, CD8 count, any experiences uh, from the panelists or Dr. Om Shirvastav? Uh, uh, it's an open question. Uh, the biomarkers to be monitored uh, for the progress of the disease, uh, especially with thymus and alpha. Okay, would you like me to answer that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So look, I, I, I'll tell you there are there are hospitals and clinicians who will say, please do a serum ferritin, see, please do a serum LDH. Please do a D-dimer. Uh, uh, please do uh, uh, a pro BNP. Okay, all of these have their role in assessing severity, but all of these also have a number of confounders. All right, the ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So is the fibrinogen. The the pro BNP can be elevated for very num different number of reasons in a number of other conditions, but it has to be over a certain value before you can say that this pro and PNP is indicative of myocarditis, myocardial injury. The, the, the cases that, say, Dr. Tambe was describing, you know, the sudden death or the total history of having a very basic set of complaints and the unfortunate event where the patient succumbed is almost always because of the asystole that comes out of myocarditis. Now, viral myocarditis in itself is something that carries anywhere from 30 40% to about a 70% mortality. So I'm not sure if there is a single uh, biomarker that can be done as, done as a blood test that will accurately give you that, look, this is getting better or getting worse because fibrinogens will start to get elevated. If you've got a, an underlying fibrinogen or a basic D-dimer on the third or the fourth day, then your patient has something which is underlying that is already starting this process. It is not something which is the marker that will tell you that COVID is getting aggressive. So how you interpret these is a little bit tricky. And none of these markers have got an absolute, you know, set in stone kind of value for the evaluation of COVID. More than the marker, I would have to say that we are, look, you know, we are basically clinicians. We don't treat papers. We don't treat numbers. We treat patients. And when you've got somebody who's got a high risk situation, that is the time that your preventive strategy should have kicked into place. For instance, I'll tell you, uh, uh, in my own practice, I find that I've now looked after about 23 people who were obese, a BMI of more than 29. All right. In all of these people, I have chosen to do the baseline biomarkers. But in all of these people, all 29 have met with some complication even after COVID is over. And this is complication, not just immediately during the infective phase, but up to three months after COVID is over. Now, obesity is a state of permanent inflammation, permanent inflammation, All right? So to do and say, look, I've got, I've got a, a D-dimer that is in, you know, 30,000, 40,000. Well, that may be the case, 
I would be more interested in knowing what the CRP is. It's it's a very very small kind of a tool to make a make a diagnosis. But a CRP is probably more valuable to me than doing any of these markers. So we will all go through. We'll all go through a process of of setting our own boundaries and parameters on how to make the assessment of a high risk patient. I have my own set of uh, you know tools. But I tend to rely more on my clinical skills than on a paper. I don't know if that answers your question. Perfect. I think this is for. Can I, can I can I add to that, uh, Dr. Vadva? Of course, sir. Yeah, Dr. Vadva is rightly said by Dr. Om Shivastava that you may have one parameter which is raised up. You know, most of the patients' relatives come, so sir, ferritin is raised up. So how to treat? You know, there is no need actually if the patient is what ultimately what you need is the walking patient who is oxygen saturation is well maintained up and who is not going in any of those uh, uh, clinical signs up. And I think clinical assessment is better. Let the count be. You know, as he has rightly said, if you know obese patient, if you are finding D dimer which is more than ten thousand, you just have to say, yeah, okay, let it be. We are not treating that. We will give you these medicines up, and it will come gradually. So you have to develop the immunity. You have to develop the good nutrition. There, the role of um, all the selenium, zinc, vitamin C, all these cocktails come, and I think they play a very big role in a day-to-day -day life of uh, improving immunity. Including the only evidence is the exercise. And I, my request to all the doctors who are listening, that do the daily exercise. And I think that is the only way of improving your <laughs> immunity. That's just a take-home message apart from clinical, what uh, Om Shivastava has said. Wonderful. You, have to, you know, there is nothing other than clinical. Uh, I think this is for Dr. Pankaj. You know, he, as he rightly pointed in another case, you know, the void steroid as well, you know, the benefits of Hamilton Alpha has been very prominently seen. Very interesting question that where would you, you know, see, uh, do you really, would, you know, in case dexamethasone has to be used, would you really uh, uh, taper it uh, for that uh, matter? Because I think uh, UK data has, first of all, you know, put it in the evidence-based medicine that how steroids can be uh, useful. And number two, you know, uh, the challenge with uh, hyperglycemia induced or maybe the new onset diabetes induced by steroid, you know, how do you balance out that perspective? Over to Dr. Pankaj. Uh, can you repeat? Uh, your voice was just breaking. Yeah, sir. Uh, the, the 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 question is that in case you know, as one of the question, one of the case you had mentioned that you know steroids were not required, uh, but in case uh, if you would have used dexamethasone, would you have tapered? Uh, and also, in case uh, if steroid would have been there, uh, the hyperglycemia impact of steroids, how difficult, how challenging it is to you know address that issue. Actually, in uh, like in patients uh, who has been given steroid for less than five days or six days, uh, we do not taper. But in cases patient requiring steroid for a longer duration, we do taper, like gradually taper over uh, next seven to eight days or ten days. But you know, uh, in few patients, uh, we require prolonged steroid therapy. So that is uh, one of the things. And hyperglycemia definitely that that is a big problem with the steroid users. Uh, most of the patient, or I may say, 100% uh, of the patient, they do lap, land up in hyperglycemia, whether they are uh, diabetic or not. So most of the times, we do control uh, hyperglycemia with the help of steroid, and slightly a little bit uh, higher threshold we keep for uh, hyperglycemia level. So around 180 to 200, uh, we tolerate those levels. But above that, uh, we uh, find it better to control with uh, IV insulin. And uh, once we start tapering uh, steroids, gradually it takes, I mean, uh, blood sugar level comes down. But, the, you know, uh, we have seen the patients, like, uh, they, they, they take a lot of time uh, when their uh, blood sugar gets settled. So uh, it induces a state of hyperglycemia even while we are tapering the steroids. So normally patient takes uh, four to six weeks more uh, when their uh, glucose level comes to the baseline after starting the steroid therapy. So, uh, therefore, it's very pertinent and important to have a, a strict watch on their blood sugar levels as well, uh, post-discharge. I think these are 
it would not be wrong to call steroids and become a you know something like a necessary evil uh, we have to utilize but very cautiously at the same time the evil has to be watched yeah one more thing which uh, i think uh, is a question matter of concern like uh, what i feel uh, most of the time we uh, patient complain of weakness muscle pain and uh, blah blah so this is like post covid syndrome so i think uh, uh, we must uh, uh, study and find out whether this steroid is uh, the cause behind post covid weakness post covid myopathy and post covid hyperglycemia so uh, we need uh, a larger Uh, light and larger studies to find out uh, the optimal doses, the optimal duration, and uh, modality of treatment to reduce uh, the severity of post-COVID syndrome, myalgia, and weakness. So, Pankaj, one thing which we have observed is that they usually have the loss of taste and uh, uh, they eat less. And most of the patients with uh, those who are, you know, I have seen them with very low potassium. So. just monitoring blood sugar along with potassium i think keeps them and i am a strong proponent that potassium has to be at a very high level at least of 4.5 so that most of the systems are functioning well so potassium and then tapering of the steroids only if the oxygen saturation if the oxygen saturation is not maintaining i think you should not think of tapering steroids definitely, it's a definitely. mainstay of the treatment i think it yes, is oxygen definitely. saturation which decide up let the because hyperglycemia can be controlled with iv insulin so most right. of the peer thing is yes, because i suffered up i had a covid you know let me tell you i am on insulin so i had a covid i was working with the patients yes. and then i when i when it came to a uh, severity index of 8 i decided no and then uh, of course the things changed up that i had to stop my work And, and uh, whatever, but then uh, it's okay. You know, I, I I think of those who blame that diabetics are more prone or these people after sixty five because I'm sixty five. Oh, I also okay the age. But I think of what is important to is how you monitor these parameters of day to day parameters, basic parameters like electrolytes, sugar, uh, these. And if you keep them in a, a proper thing of exercise and things, I think things are. very different uh, one, i'd like to offer a point of view dr ratambe and dr pankaj sir yeah well, you you finish sir, and i would like to offer a point of view yeah uh, shall i yes sir yeah actually one thing which uh, uh, i just uh, has some uh, difference like do i, I do use steroid uh, uh, while there is oxygen demand but i feel uh, what is the role of using steroid beyond 2 weeks of illness so i i don't exactly know whether it is helpful or uh, or not so that that is one point another point is that definitely steroid has to be uh, has to have some role uh, with uh, the control of uh, uh, blood sugar levels another thing is that uh, addition of magnesium because uh, i use magnesium in my most of the patients along with uh, keeping their potassium level on a higher side yeah. so uh, question remains there whether steroid is of help or of how much help after two weeks of uh, hypoxemia or uh, oxygen desaturation that is a question in fact this is one of the question also in the chat box that do we need to taper the steroid during discharge or when the patient has actually improved the saturation so do okay. we relate with Wait, the one minute i i, I just I, go back to one of the things that we were discussing the yeah, yeah, yeah. i'd like to make a comment this is my own perspective on the weakness that we are talking about in some of my patients about 13 11 12 13 patients where an emg was done because the weakness was so profound all right people who had proximal muscle weakness they they could not get out of the chair or the bed they could not do the basics so the proximal muscle weakness especially starting at the hip joints and lasting for you know several weeks 6 weeks 8 weeks 10 weeks in some of them where an emg was done after the opinion of a of a neurologist these patients were behaving there is a there is a condition that is described which is called uh, melas which is the mitochondrial myopathy with lactic acid syndrome melas mitochondrial mitochondrial involvement leading to myopathy associated with lactic acid so it's called melas the other condition is murf which is the mitochondrial myopathy with ragged red fibers right both these conditions have been described in profound inflammation that affects the spindles of muscles in a way that it becomes very difficult for patients to even do the basics of their their motor functions 
in both these conditions the key is trying to get rid of this part of the myopathy and the lactic acidosis so we all know those of us who who who, who exercise for more than a particular time you will feel that pleasant ache in your muscles that is because of the lactic that accumulates that is the lactic acid that accumulates but this lactic acid that is i'm trying to quantify it uh, you know coming out of people who got the the weakness that will last for weeks and weeks and weeks and months i'm trying to quantify it i'm trying to get in touch with those laboratories that can do this specific lactic acidosis or lactate lactate measurement specific to the muscle weakness still not there but i'm work i'm talking to at least six laboratories so the point i'm making is that this is responsive not to not to magnesium or to uh, or to zinc you know the role of magnesium and zinc is more when you are having so the the proteolytic enzyme in the macrophage that goes from the acidic media to the alkaline media before the virus can actually upgrade that is where the magnesium and zinc is important that's why before your patient has got covid i asked them to take this this both these things and the dose of both zinc and magnesium has to be supra physiological magnesium must be 1000 mg and zinc must be 100 mg a day all right if your patient can tolerate that there is a very good chance that your patient or when i say patient i mean people who are seeing you for other conditions this person is not likely to be getting covid that certainly be in my story i i am i been on this regimen along with a prophylactic regimen for the last about 33 34 weeks now and so far it has worked for me so this is a bad joke that i say in a lot of platforms where we are discussing covid that now we will have to isolate and quarantine people who don't have covid because otherwise everybody else has covid okay mm. the people who don't have covid are a minority they must be isolated otherwise those people who got covid that is the vast majority they should be roaming around freely you know so that is one aspect but the weakness that i'm talking about is going to be responsive to only very specific agents that look at getting rid of this lactate from the muscles otherwise people patients will experience weakness for weeks and sometimes months together very well very well Uh, we have another Vadva, i must tell you yeah. dr vadva yeah. i must tell you that we are lucky that uh, uh, in a abg one of the parameters which is added is a serum lactate so uh, uh, we are lucky every time we do and we treat with giving fluids so that at least uh, lactate is uh, uh, taken care by uh, the kidneys and uh, we, we we have a easy control of uh, uh, yeah it's a very nice point of uh, dr shivasva has said and yeah. it's very common to have a myopathy and a neuropathy with covid very common yeah. very very interesting you, question from dr anand anand dr vadva uh, we are uh, running out of time yes, so last, this will be the last question yeah, yeah. so we have a very interesting question from dr anand dogre that in critical scenario with hscrt score of 16 by 25 any positive outcomes in fact uh, this was a trigger that uh, uh, why uh, gufic actually decided to launch one of the reason to launch uh, thymosin alpha has been that you know because there has been publication evidence based strong evidence based perspectives that it has shown dramatic improvement in terms of replenishment of uh, immunological markers as far as the severe cases have been concerned so that was the trigger you know it's always start from the extreme right hand side then over a period of time and in fact lot of anecdotal reports and one of the examples of the cases which has just been accepted at the american society of tropical medicine and hygiene on the toughest uh, respectable uh, peer review uh, forum you know in fact uh, one of the examples which have been accepted there speaks out you know how uh, not just the extreme scenarios but now moderate cases also have shown significant improvement so uh, the, the 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 consistently what has been demonstrated is the the replenishment of the t cells has been one of the reasons that it really works not just in the extreme scenario but also in the uh, 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 moderate uh, uh, cases as well so uh, i think uh, uh, if any comment is there from the uh, from the speakers welcome Otherwise, dr think... namit you are supposed to ask the last question yes this is this was the last question from dr nand ogre will put across uh, 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 you know the extreme uh, scenarios versus you know the moderate experience any 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 specific uh, experiences with respect to the moderate cases from the speakers you know if any Not, uh... yeah so moderate cases especially when you are using an agent which is as as effective as thymosin alpha tend to do very well so do 
mild cases severe cases also do well but like i've been saying from the beginning once you once you allow a certain cascade to so set in then it becomes a little difficult to have the kind of recovery that we would expect for a patient to be walking talking getting out of icu can still be done but the the timing of thymosin alpha is best for the mild to moderate category very well and I moreover think. it is a very cost effective therapy i think if you consider if you uh, consider other immunotherapies i think it is the most cost effective apart from glutamine and uh, other okay. um, uh, agents which we are using the number of hospital days stays yeah. moderate remains yeah. for lady you know progressing is cost effective yeah yeah halting the progress no. of the disease i think to a, a defined pathway which becomes very important yeah. i think this is a wonderful discussion you know not just a virtual contribution i think everyone has contributed in reducing the carbon footprint as well you know by 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 not physically traveling and contributing to the science we have saved so much resources globally and make the world little bit more healthier as well for each one of us so over to uh, uh, shekhar uh, uh, shekhar you are on mute yeah, yeah. Samra samrat yeah samrat please yeah, yeah uh, so doctors uh, this uh, webinar session uh, was sponsored in technical collaboration uh, for gopik biosciences uh, limited for any further queries uh, related to immunosin alpha that is our thymosin alpha uh, you can write to us on info@gopikbio.com and we, our medical team will uh, will be happily answering your questions related to thymosin alpha uh, the webinar was sponsored by immunosin alpha uh, modulus immunet perfectly that is lyophilized thymosin alpha and we are the Uh, Indian innovator uh, of this uh, molecule, and we introduced this molecule first time in India uh, in the month of July this year. And over to Shekhar Da. Yeah, thank you, Samrat. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, one regards from Gufi Kitikir. Uh, it's my immense pleasure uh, and to thank all delegates for joining with us from your busy schedule. <laughs> Uh, we are thankful to honorable speaker dr om sibasta leading consultant in infectious disease and hiv medicine for sparing your valuable time and sharing your knowledge and experience we are thankful to dr bilas tambe director tambe critical care nagpur and dr pankaj kumar omar director critical care sri narayana hospital raipur for sharing their practical experience through case presentation we are thankful to dr navneet dr shetty for all coordination and making the session very very interactive uh, as a flag bearer gufik biosciences has taken all initiatives uh, to update medical fraternity regarding the role of thymosin alpha in covid 19 patients through series of webinars case presentations and ongoing multi centric phase 3 trials as approved by dcgi Very soon, we will update regarding investigator-initiated trial feedback of immunosin alpha on severe COVID-19 patients through OANR. Uh, it's our pleasure to inform that within few months' launch, more than 5,000 COVID-19 patients have been treated successfully with immunosin alpha. More than two lakhs injections have been used so far. We are thankful to all doctors who have. tried passed on the benefits of immunosin alpha to covid-19 patients for the speedy recovery we are sincerely thankful to all doctors for having passed on gofix world class quality unit lifelizing products for saving the life of million patients once again thank you all for joining with us good night thank you very much thank you thank you so much